I'm back. Everybody's back. <clears throat> awesome. Yay. Hey. Cool. Hey so yeah, now now is typically the time where we have we give new folks a chance to introduce themselves. So um, if you're new, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we can call on you to introduce yourself, who you are, um, why you're here in about one minute or less. And um, don't forget mm -hmm. to put your LinkedIn profile in the chat so we can connect with you there. Um, anyone new on the call? Yeah, uh, Ken and Kelly, ready uh, from Ready to Grow. Awesome, nice to meet you. What brings you here? Um, we actually got recommended by um, a good client of ours, Irma, um, who's running Gen for Gen. And she knows that we're really passionate about, we, we do a lot of work in the future work uh, space and, and building teams. And we have a, a different way of, of doing it. We've traveled the world um, and work for companies like PayPal and, and we've seen what works and what doesn't work. More um, of a hands-on approach. Yeah, we, we were sort of this start of, um, you know, before remote working was cool because of COVID, um, <clears throat> we were actually building remote teams, you know, way back in, in the early thousands um, in over in China. Um, and then we, we transferred and migrated over to Ireland and then back to Australia. So we, we've been around the world um, doing this and working remotely with, with different teams. And uh, we've got some strategies. We love to hear what other people are doing. And, and knowing firsthand experiences of trying to, you know, the challenges of working remote. And then obviously post-COVID, there's new challenges and a lot of things, a lot more, you know, mental and emotional things to take into account now so and we focus a lot on the culture building so like how to build really great culture so that was one of the things that we did um post-covid was we had a large team over in manila when i was cio of cancer.com.au and um we we had roughly around 80 uh, devs over there and it was a struggle to overcome the aussie objection to using remote talent um and trying to get people the first thing to do was was getting a common understanding that People have gone through the same type of training. They've gone through the same things. And getting people to hear each other's stories was a big part of what we do. Um, so we, we'd build um, team events around getting to hear people's stories and start with that because it's a lot easier to bond with somebody or to look at somebody um, as a peer when you know their background and know mm -hmm. some cool facts about them. And advocate the tools for communication, like integrating Slack and being able to help, you know, to bridge the gap between the two cultures is something I think was very, very much needed. But also bringing people together. So it, remote work is great, but you also need that um, contact point at some point. So mm -hmm. you need to be able to show people the culture, bring people from the remote teams. So if people are working overseas, bring them into your mm -hmm. local culture and explain to them why. For Cancer, for example, it was uh, explaining to the developers why credit cards were important to families or why a mortgage or a car loan, something that wasn't accessible in their local market was really important and how, you know, they contributed to the noble purpose of what we were doing. Um, that really helped because when people understand something and, and they can feel the um, emotion behind it, um, it helps them be more passionate about what they're doing. They can kind of connect to it. And then it makes them want to have that stuff for their own life. And then we worked with the um, DPOs to help create new opportunities for them locally. So I think that's really that's the future. really great. Thanks. Th thanks, Kelly. That's really awesome. Okay. Do you throw your info in the, in the uh, chat? I just want to make sure we've got time for everybody to kind of introduce themselves. Really appreciate it. it sounds like you guys are doing some exciting work. Thanks. Who else is new? Dang it. Uh, Ilya? Is that how you pronounce it? How do you pronounce your name? Yeah, you, you got it, actually. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. What brings you here? Yeah, well, first off, sorry for the bad hair day here. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have a virtual background. and it, yeah, anyway. um, I got an invite for this event. I've been meaning to come for a long time, but um, we have two young kids, and they're not uh, here right now because they're with uh, my, my, my parents, and so I got some time, so I figured I'd jump in. Um, so I guess um, just about myself, I'm a entrepreneur, um, grew up starting different companies, uh, always kind of in the sales and marketing space and kind of fell into HR because we created an online school to teach developers around the world English and soft skills. And then realized that those people are actually really good software and tech professionals and connected them to employers and they're about 2000 hires now. So yeah, that's kind of how we got into this, this world. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, if you have questions for us, I can happy to chat about that too. But really Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish I would have uh, came sooner or uh, attended sooner. We're glad oh, you're uh, here. It's here as well as our website. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lorraine? Can I actually ask people a favor? Sorry, last thing. Uh, we're just about to launch a new website next week and just this is the dev site so you can actually just like don't share this. Uh, but if you have any feedback on if it's clean or, or not or it's confusing, that'd be really cool. 
Awesome. Thanks, Ilya. That's great. Yeah. Um, Lorraine? Hi, um, I was told about this by Erin. I don't know if Erin's here today, Erin Peters. And I know Rochelle as well. We're um, part of the Association of the Future of Work. Can I recognize some other faces? So I run NAML. We, um, NAML was born for my research. I'm looking at refugees in the Middle East. And NAML supports refugees with the skills to work remotely and links them to jobs. So we look at highly skilled refugees, um, data, you know, coders. So Ilya, good, it would be great to speak to you coders, um, data analysts, really high skilled refugees who, if it weren't for their situation, they'd be in the situation that, that we are now. So working with this really good talent to get them the training and the skills to access the type of work that we do. And I'm also a researcher at Cambridge University. And, um, oh, I see Denise, oh my God. Yeah, Cambridge, researcher at Cambridge University, do consultancy for the ILO as well. So lots of different things. Great, Lorraine, thanks for being um, here. Um, I'm I'm going to say this incorrectly. You speak. Yes. Awesome. What brings you here? Yes. Okay. Oh, there we are. I wasn't sure if I was uh, on mute or not. Um, it's not the first time I'm here, uh, but we go on and off, and sometimes we join other members of the team. So John introduced us to OA, and um, we had some conversations uh, around an MSP a while back that uh, we need to retake. And we also quite active in the freelancer first uh group uh, so we are managing a freelancer platform for business tech in europe and in middle east uh since 2015-16 awesome thanks for being thanks. here nice to meet you uh caroline hey thank you of course this is not my first time but maybe it's been a long time since i've introduced myself so i'm the co-founder of hybrati we platform we do matchmaking between expert consultants and subject matter experts from all around the world, specifically with projects in the Middle East. Awesome, thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we didn't get to you, feel free to put your um, information in your LinkedIn profile in the chat and we'll connect with you there. Um, the last housekeeping item, does anyone have any upcoming events or webinars they'd like to mention? I think someone from Outvise might be on the call. Um, yeah, myself. <laughs> um, Okay, so we are planning a webinar in a couple of weeks' time. I'll share the link um, on the chat with uh, the guys from Gig AI and Torch. And um, we were discussing about technology, how to apply technology to different stages of the process, uh, scoping of opportunities, um, enrichment of CVs, matching and automating um, the, the admin side and management of projects. Uh, there was a good discussion, uh, different approaches, different challenges based on the types of platforms. Some <clears throat> platforms are very specialized, so the challenges that they have are one sort. We are very broad, so we have a different set of challenges and we cannot apply the same type of technologies. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm inviting anyone that would like to join um, to the webinar. I'm going to put the link in the chat, so feel free to, to register. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Anyone else? Hey, Ash, I just want to call out Kristen because Kristen, it's been a while since you've been on the call. And, and you were so formative early on when we were starting this thing. And I know you've started a new company since. So can you give us a, just a, a minute update on what you're doing and what you're thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, nice to see everyone. I don't want to take up too much time. I know there's a, an amazing agenda today. Um, but as John mentioned, was involved in the OA in the beginning and have less than a year in started a, a people and change practice working with organizations to do all sorts of things, but really connect kind of people strategy with a lot of the transformation we're seeing within business. So working in employer brands, um, culture change, learning and development, a big one, and super proud to say that we've been able to go so far with an open talent network. Um, and partnering with organizations in the interesting ecosystem. So it's a cool time to be experimenting in this place and happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. Hey, and I got to call out San too, because San, that's a sweet haircut, man. I haven't seen you in a while either. What are you up to? I'm looking fresh for spring. Hello, everyone. Awesome. See you all. I'm just down the road in San Diego today, and man, this this kind of atmospheric, you know, river is quite the quite amazing. So. It's uh, um, and it's like gorillas in the mist here in, in Malibu. It's like I can't see. It's four foot visibility. It's crazy. It's really crazy. So good to see you. That's awesome. awesome. Hey, All right. Hey, well, Barry, well yeah. one, one other thing, Ash, Barry, you want to give a quick update on kind of what we're 
what we're doing on the tech side of things and sure yeah very very briefly i don't want to take up too much people's time but um but yeah it's, i think people are probably aware that we've been building a platform of platforms basically a we call it the open assembly gateway so to make it as easy as possible for enterprise buyers to access talent from any platform the idea being is almost conceptually a bit like an MSP, but for freelance talent platforms. So we generate demand from enterprises and then we take that demand, put it into a digital form and then pass it to the most appropriate platform in our view, which could be any platform. And then the platform has over, a, you know, to a certain ser service level, let's say in 24 hours to return with um, the profiles that meet what our clients looking for. And um, we have, you know, without going through all the detail, we have compliance, indemnities, insurance, contract. Can someone put that person on mute, please? Okay. Adit? Uh, Brandon, can you mute Adit? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so it's a really simple, we, we hope it's a very simple fast safe secure way of being able to search for talent across multiple platforms um, in a consistent way and so the enterprises we work with really like it talent platforms we work with really like it as well because we're not trying to disintermediate in any way they still have the relationship with the client we're just doing the searching and the matching and then adding a compliance and background checking layer to make it as safe as to, safe as possible so um, we think that's game changing for the industry because we believe that the industry hasn't scaled to the extent that we thought it would when we got involved in it many, many years ago, because the supply side is so incredibly complex and varied and varying in quality um, and in service levels and in functionality. And that on the business side, from the demand side, it's so complex for businesses to be able to source directly from platforms. So what we've created uh, solves for both of those things a consistent way of accessing talent from multiple platforms and a consistent way of setting business processes in a compliant, safe and secure way so that they're able to contract. So Harry, that's what we've been building. Say again? What's this called? Uh, this... It's, 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 it's Open Assembly's business, basically. So it's the Open Assembly gateway, and we're just gateway. about to sort of launch it properly. So we've got clients on it already, and, um, and it's working really well. And we're now ready to sort of take it to the world. Sounds like sounds like something that could really solve problems. I've worked for a number of larger companies, including Novartis, which basically have you know, problems finding their way, and, and Unilever as well, find, problems finding their way to platforms. Yeah, so, absolutely. So enterprises like it. The staffing industry likes it because it gives them access to talent platforms. The talent platforms we're working with seem to really like it because we're generating demand for them at a very low cost in a consistent way. So we think it's a win-win for the industry. We're super excited about it. How is it different from a party that used to be there at Fulcrum, who also kind of was a consolidator of platforms? Yeah, sure. sure. We know the Fulcrum guys pretty well. Um, I think Sean's left now, works with People 2.0. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so we, we know them relatively well. They were trying to do the sort of digital API into all of the platforms, which is incredibly difficult. And we'd like to do that too. You'd like a Google search across every platform and have direct APIs into them all. But I think we're a long way from that. So we're taking an asynchronous based approach, almost like becoming the, the white glove service where you're using a platform, but you've also got people involved because we think that curation is still required. And Fulcrum, I think we're, we're trying to go digital Straight, straight away. I think what they're trying to create is really good. I think it's just been really difficult um, for them. I mean, they may be more successful than I'm giving them credit for, but I think they find it quite hard to get enterprise scale. Right. I mean, that's still, you know, in our, our mind, you know, when we set out to start this community, it was, it was really to, to solve for two problems, right? I mean, the goal here is to transform work for a billion people by 2025. And the two big keys are how do we create consistent language, which now we're doing it. The book that comes out in the fall, Open Talent, and Jen and I wrote from from it's coming out from Harvard Business Press. And thanks to so many people in the group that have you know contributed to the book and and helped edit the book and, and now reviewed the book. And then you know one of the challenges we've had is on creating consistent processes. We were doing that in a consulting practice, and and you know so many people on this call suggested that hey, if you really want to 
create scale and really transform work for a billion people, what you have to do is really look at it as a digital solve instead of a, a consulting solve. So we're really focused on that. It seems like there's a lot of interest here for that. So maybe one of the things we should do, Ashley, is, is do an upcoming session just on this, this problem solve and talk to a lot of the platforms and make sure that everybody's included in the, in the, in the solve here as we build things out. I know we're kind of tight on time, so maybe we should shift to the next thing. So I, I'm really stoked to hear what, what Roland has to say in, in his presentation. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, Roland, feel free to kick things off. Um, introduce yourself and, and we'll go from there. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ashley. I will uh, just share my screen now for you guys as well. Excellent. Great. Well, it's a, a real honour to be asked to present in front of this group. Um, I've been in this space for a while, um, both working for and consulting various kind of tech HR technology platforms, working with companies like Freelancer.com, you know, Juno, advising on the Baja platform in the Middle East, um, and most recently working for Deal as well. So um, it's a space that I'm very fond of. Um, I've been asked here today um, to speak to you about one of Deal's reports, which we've just released, um, which is a report on the state of global hiring. Now, it's quite an in-depth report, and I'm not going to go through it all with you today, but I just thought I'd go through some of the, the kind of key aspects of that. But before we dive into that, I just thought at a very high level, I'll quick, give you a quick introduction to Deal so you know who we are and, and why we've created this report. So Deal as an organisation, we, we help companies eliminate hiring borders. So anyone anywhere in the world can access new opportunities. Um, now, we're a relatively young company. We've only been going since 2019. But during that time, we've already been able to help 18,000 customers. Um, we set up 90 plus entities of our own to be able to kind of uh, enable solutions for our customers. Our last uh, funding round, we were valued at 12 billion. Um, last year's ARR was 295 million, and we're already up to 2,000 staff in that. So we have a value at, at Deal called Deal Speed. Where we like to do everything very quickly in a short period of time. Now, we help lots of different customers from small one-man startups all the way through to big, large global enterprises, which is where I spend most of my time. Um, you can see here some of the, the, the names that, that we're dealing with in a variety of kind of employment type solutions, but a, a big significant part of that is around kind of global contractor solutions in the freelancer and kind of open talent space. Um, so having a look at the report itself, so how have we managed to kind of get some insightful data for you? So, so we've got lots of really interesting data at Deal. So last year we were able to analyze over 260,000 contracts um, which were put together through Deal. That equated to 5 billion in payments um, for over 15,000 customers, you know, across 160 different countries. And we also looked at about 500,000 additional data points um, that we could use to, to put this together. Now, some of the, the key highlights that, that's worth going through. So hiring health in general last year. So, you know, thumbs up, global hiring grew by 145% last year. So that was really positive. Um, our fastest growing regions that we saw were APAC growing fastest, then Latin America, then EMEA, then North America. Now, these aren't our largest markets. These were just the markets that were growing at the fastest pace. On the downside last year, you know, we saw terminations rise by 107% across the year. Uh, and we looked at that by looking at uh, early terminations as a percentage of all total contracts ending. Um, and in January, 20, uh, at the beginning of the year, that was 28%. And by the end of the year, that was up to 42%. Now, some of the countries most impacted that by that were the US, the UK, Spain, Mex Mexico, uh, and Portugal. Now, a lot of this was down to just general economic conditions last year, you know, lots of threats of recessions and, and caution, but specifically in the kind of remote global hiring world, you know, tech was really impacted by that. And all the way through to, to the big tech layoffs with big organizations, all the way through to, to smaller bootstrap companies, there were a lot of layoffs in tech um, last year, which had a big impact. Um, but still, on the whole, it was good for salaries in, in remote hiring, um, but some, some areas grew faster than others. With last year's inflation, you would expect most salaries to be rising, but it wasn't the case for everybody. Um, Philippines had some really impressive salary growth 
at 36 um, percent and that's a real kind of growing area for us for people to be able to, to engage with talent india and brazil very strong figures there as well but also some declines um, especially in latin america we, we saw a number of declines in, in average salaries um, i think part of that was a lot of the time historically i think latam relies a lot from hiring from the us and the us did slow down a little bit um, but there were some big big numbers there um, moving on more into the kind of skills things and, and what we could draw from the report there. So it would be no surprise to people that on a remote hiring platform, you know, the big job titles were software engineers, devs, product designers, product managers, QA, project managers, etc. Um, but what was more insightful, actually, is taking away that those kind of big main roles you know, there's been a real kind of emergence of other roles coming through, which we would have never thought would be kind of remote global roles before. You know, lots of accountants, therapists, teachers, lawyers. And if, you know, we were saying four or five years ago, you know, a really bit one of our fastest growing roles on deal would be remote teachers internationally, people probably wouldn't have believed it. But um, the world of work is changing, not just for that kind of core area. Um, other things that were a surprise is, is salary trends. And when we looked at a lot of our kind of big job groups, you know, there were a lot of lot of uh, salaries going backwards, you know, especially software engineers going minus 7%. Um, and you would have thought, you know, in, in this global skill shortage, why would that be happening? Now, there's a couple of key things that I think are behind that. One, you know, general economic slowdown, especially when we're talking about the contractor market, um, that's often heavily kind of, exposed by sudden shifts in supply and demand. Lots of contractors suddenly lose their job. There's suddenly a, a, an influx of demand and, and rates will go down a little bit. But I also think there's a wider pattern here. As you know, remote work is growing every year and people are doing more of it, countries are, are hiring more remote workers and, and looking further afield as they go. And traditionally, when people would hire, they would hire locally. And if you're in the US, Maybe you hire someone and it's for 100,000, but you can now go and hire in other countries at lower rates. So there's this global pressure I bet on, on the kind of unit cost of work um, and a kind of globalization of work, which is actually bringing down the cost. Um, and that's seen with, uh, especially with developers in kind of uh, emerging countries, you know, they're own typically 28% more working for an international organization than working from home as well, uh, for a home country, company. Um, then looking at uh, a bit of an insight into kind of trends in geographies. So here we've got what are our, our kind of hottest countries to get hired from. Top again for this year is the United States. That's mainly because a there's you know a very high quality of talent in the United States that's very appealing to other countries. Also, it's a very big country as well with a large market as well. The main people hiring people from the U.S. are, are, are Mexico. Canada is, as you would expect, being, you know, same language and time zone, but also from Australia as well. As we mentioned, and as we saw with the salary increases in Philippines, you know, that's one of our, our hottest areas for people to find talent from. Australia, you can imagine are hiring a, a lot from the Philippines because there's, um, A, the time zones match up quite nicely. And also Australia is, is quite challenging with their visa laws to find to get talent into the country and you're able to if you work with someone in, remotely on a contract or a freelance basis or an EOR basis it's a lot easier to engage with them than bringing them over and then the US and the UK obviously I, th I think they look to the Philippines you know for that lower unit cost of work where they can still get a very high standard of person you know, leading the way in, in LATAM is, is Argentina for talent um, and then there's been a, a few kind of shifts in places between the United Kingdom and, and India. Now, United Kingdom has moved up the rankings in terms of talent and being hired internationally. And I think the reason for that um, is a couple of things. One, um, the UK has probably been disproportionately affected in terms of its economic performance. Um, and we have a high reliance on tech jobs. Um, being one of the tech hubs of the world, which has also hit us quite hard. So I think there's been more talent looking to, to look externally. I think traditionally a lot of British contractors have always worked in Germany and France, but historically they used to have to travel to go there and stay away. And now it's just much easier to do that um, and do it remotely. So I think there's, there's more there. India's gone down um, actually in the rankings and, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, 
as we saw also, you know, salaries are going up in India a lot and, and it's no longer as cheap to hire people in India as it used to be. And also, you know, their economy is rocking at the moment. They've got loads of good jobs locally, domestically. And I think a lot of Indians are, are wanting to work domestically rather than purely being reliant on, 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 on international work as much. Hey, but, hey, Roland, I don't know whether it's just me, but I can just see a blank slide right now. How bizarre. You saw the others, OK? Yeah, yeah, I could see all of the others. It might just, I don't know whether it was just me or not, but you were talking about all these countries. I'm expecting to see... I think I was expecting to see something like this. Yes, I can now see it. Oh, that's good. How strange. Um, ho hopefully, yeah, you can see a bit yeah. more content to what I was speaking about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Thank you. So, yeah, th there we go. And, and then top cities globally for remote work at the moment are London with number one, then followed by Toronto, Buenos Aires, Madrid, um, and Bangalore as well. So I'll share this later if people want more time to digest some of the numbers there. Um, last things to highlight in the report were around payments, really. Um, and one of the interesting spaces is around crypto. Deals one of the few platforms that allows people to get paid um, in crypto. But over the year, you know, interest and, and payments in crypto withdrawals were down on the year. You know, they went from 5% down to 4%. I think there's a couple of things um, leading that. One is the crypto market was a bit rocky last year and, and, and probably lack of confidence in it. Um, Deal also produced um, something called the Deal Card last year um, because we, we pay a lot of people in countries who have got quite unstable currencies. And that's why they liked crypto because it was a bit more stable. But on the Deal Card, it meant people could get paid onto their Deal Card as kind of like a prepaid debit card in US dollars. And I think a lot of the people that, that were going to crypto were perhaps opting to get paid um, there. We still see, as you would expect, Bitcoin as, as the number one um, cryptocurrency that people opt to get paid in. Um, so that's it, really, as, as a quick summary. So, you know, to summarize some of those points, you know, there's been a despite some of the increases in terminations, global hiring demand remains strong and is definitely growing. Um, the globalization of work is definitely distributing opportunity more evenly around the world. And this is reducing the global unit cost of work. Um, and also global remote re works really not just for software developers and designers, it's going far deeper than that in terms of the movement and how it's changing. And HR technology like Deal and, and a lot of the other platforms who will be here today are really changing the, the way that the world works um, and operates. Um, so that's it from me. If, if you want the full report, mm. you know, drop me an email directly, I'll, I'll share it with you or reach out to me over LinkedIn. Um, or you can just hop on deal.com and just um, download it um, directly yourself as well. Um, if we've got any time, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Awesome, Roland. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Connor Heaney. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you yeah. first, I guess. Like, <laughs> there's so much application. And, and what are you observing, sort of, where you are and what you do, not only from a risk and compliance perspective, but like what you're seeing? Does the, does the data sort of validate what you're seeing? Yeah, it does. It does actually, and, and thanks so much for uh, inviting me. It's great, great to see everyone. It's been way too long, John, and thanks for the warm welcome, Roland. Lovely to see you, mate. Um, I have to say, I always love listening to you. You cannot beat a lovely English accent, and um, the data and information that Roland uh, produced is is really interesting to the eye. So, um, actually, answer your question uh, directly and succinctly. Yes, we're we're seeing a similar trend to. Those that Roland um, has, has pointed out, particularly in relation to growth in the regions, countries that um, Roland and, and Deal have identified. The, the one thing, um, Roland, on page five of the original report, sorry, sorry, I'm going back to my law days here, right? On page five, subparagraph three, uh, but now in uh, page five, I was quite interested in the stats relation to decline in starting salaries in. Nigeria, Mexico, Netherlands, US, and Argentina. Um, in all those areas, we, we've seen growth, right? Um, growth in salaries. And I was wondering, are, are you guys seeing something that maybe we're not seeing in those locations? And, and do you have a view as to why there is a decline in overall starting salaries? That was the one thing that jumped out that doesn't accord with what we're seeing. Definitely. Are you referring to uh, page five of what I just presented or page five of the full report? I think it's the full report, Roland. Um, sorry, sorry, mate. Uh, but 
But in, in short, what it was saying is that there was a decline in overall average starting salaries in Nigeria, Mexico, Netherlands, US, and Argentina. Um, yes, and uh, specifically those countries. I think as we saw, um, do you know what? I'd have to think about that question more to give it a warrant answer rather than trying to answer that on, on the fly with that. Um, I haven't got the, the detailed understanding behind those countries to, to warrant it. No drama, man. It runs <laughs> great. Yeah. The re- I love that. That's it. Do you know what, man? That's always well, the best thing. I appreciate that a lot more before I actually try and give that answer that the answer <clears throat> No worries. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Um, Son, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Actually, I did, actually I wanted to pile on with another lovely English accent just to keep the keep the vibe going. Um, you can all get the full gamut of English accents today. Um, I just a remark, actually. I mean, I'm I'm working on building a a little bit of a leadership talent network, and I, I think just a remark to to thank you, Roland, for the for the the presentation. You know, I think I was impressed by this. This obviously there's so much. Um, presumption about open talent. And I was sort of impressed by this notion that, you know, one of the biggest sort of like trade routes of talent is, you know, US into the rest of North America and Australia. I, thought, I think that's kind of an impressive idea because I bet if we went out on the street and asked people what their uh, presumption of, you know, that trade route of talent, it would be, it would look maybe opposite <laughs> or certainly, you know, um, and so I think that's impressive. And I think the other thing that was impressive was, I'd love to roll and just get an expansion of what content meant. Um, and, and maybe just because I kind of work in that space, I'd love to just understand it. But I thought that was an interesting call out that this notion of content being the the sort of the, the as I read it, the most valuable sort of like, you know, transportable um, expertise. Definitely. And, and I think content is, is a very broad skills category at Deal, which includes lots of different areas within that. Um, and, you know, my two cents for why that's performed particularly well um, is, especially in the open talent world, there is opportunity for <clears throat> obscene savings by engaging with freelancers in those areas, because typically um, you would get, whether it's large enterprises or, or other companies, they're typically dealing with large advertising agencies where there's a lot of margins. Um, and I think uh, it was John Windsor once said that, you know, he went to his accountant's office and it was really flash. And he was actually, well, I'm paying for that, aren't I? That, that's where my fee's coming from. Um, and uh, with going directly to uh, freelancers, you can cut that out. So I think that's why it's performed well. And it's a cost saving way and a way to, to engage directly with really strong talent. But is but I want to I want to push back on that. I think that's been the argument that's historically been focused on for freelancers, with a lot of it focused on geographic arbitrage. I can have work done overseas for less. Is that really the right and primary message that should be pushed at this point? Isn't it more about access to flexible talent, pathways? to auditioning for full-time roles, et cetera, et cetera, and isn't sort of the cost argument, sort of haven't we already had that and, and isn't it time to move beyond if we want it to scale? And on that point, um, Jeffrey, it's a, a very good point. I, I was less talking about the geographical cost reductions there, but on content, you know, you could go to a WPP agency in London and pay X amount to get something done. And they're probably using a contractor based in London, a freelancer to deliver that work anyway. But mm. by open talent, you can kind of disrupt the supply chain and take out that unnecessary well, margin and go straight to the talent, perhaps. I, I get that, but I'm gonna, I wanna continue though on one other thing, cause you bring up a really good point. At the end of the day, the only way for this market to grow is for more employers and more organizations to hire more freelancers. And if we're positioning the model as disintermediation of employers, how are we going to get WPP to use more freelancers through what we're doing if we're suggesting we actually want to disintermediate you? Aren't there other ways to highlight where it's less about disintermediation and more about matching the right talent where where WPP doesn't view it as competitive, but more complementary, so they're more willing to invest? One little piece, and, and Matt, I'm John Younger, sorry, one little piece. I think we're re-architecting employment. I don't think yeah. it's anything smaller 
than the than the the reconceptualization of who does what work where when and how and we need to understand it in those terms because it, my problem last night i couldn't sleep i have the same problem john windsor does i, I keep an article in my head that i'm trying to write during during beta sleep and the one tonight was in five years, every major consulting firm will only have 20 to 30% full-time consultants. Mm -hmm. They need to own the client, they need to own the project, they need to own the IP, but they don't need to own anything more. And we're gonna see a reconstruction of that. And it's just an example of what Jeffrey, I think you're talking about. I mean, we are going to see a world in which less than 50% of the people working are owned colonially. Mm. I and that's I, really exciting for me. See, mm -hmm. I, again, John, you and I have had this debate. I'm I'm not sure I agree. I'm I'm not sure. I th I think it's not about good, bad, or I, I think there's still no. benefit to employer employee relationships. Yes. Are we going to see more of that flex, if you will, that shock absorber used with yeah. freelancers, whether it's because of time needs, skill needs, etc.? Yes. yes, and that's really where the message should be, not about disintermediation. Not about I can get this done cheaper by hiring John who's an ex McKinsey consultant versus hiring McKinsey. There's always going to be some of that, but the reality is no. This is this makes organizations of all sizes more nimble and more mm. able to support client needs and helps Absolutely. individuals make those decisions about do I want to be part of the McKinsey or whatever group and, and Jeffrey, where I'm getting the benefits or not. And they're, again, let them weigh those decisions. And, and Jeffrey, what it frees me to do is to have a portfolio of my own so that I'm not owned. But in fact, I'm excitedly involved in three or four really cool kinds of projects or organizations, including one that's for the betterment of mankind or and, people kind, excuse me. But that's, and if you want I mean, that's the freedom on both sides. I and if you want to make an mind. informed decision to be owned, to use your metaphor, yes. God bless, because there's certain benefits. There's trade-offs and benefits to all of it. Let's make sure everyone understands those. But Sorry, I'm on I'll get off my soapbox. But even, uh, wait, wait, wait. but even if you're- I just want to add one. Well, I, I, did, I just want to add one thing, because I've, I've lived this, right? Selling victors and spoils to Havas, trying to change Havas. Havas not willing to change. And you know, then four, four years later, they have been getting sold to Vivendi. And so- you know the reality is when you look at WPP is they're they're not telling their clients they have freelancers they have most of the work these days is by holding companies and big agencies is done by freelancers they're just playing their own value arbitrage to say I'm not you know telling you if it's an employee or a or freelancer but I'm gonna still market up four to five times and so but, the, but does the client care not, the client's buying a solution they're I going understand to WPP that, but, knowing that they're buying a solution a single neck to ring if it's not done they don't care yeah. and they know they're paying a premium for it yeah and let's we can take this one offline i mean I've, i know you know san's gone from big agencies like i have to small agencies and you know there's still a neck to ring even these days with a direct freelancer so lots you know lots to talk about here but i want to make sure we make space for everybody um hey ben you've had your hand up for a while i'd actually like to have mark speak because He's had his hand up as long, so I'll I'll go after Mark. Nice, Mark. Gonna, always good to hear from you. I was going to chip in with another English accent, um, <laughs> but but an English speak an English accent speaking from India, I would agree, uh, Roland, that we're seeing quite significant um, wage inflation uh, in India. Lots of Indians who historically would have either gone abroad to work or would have worked mm -hmm. in global supply chains are increasingly staying home because, as you say, there's a very vibrant um, economy. But to the point about the London agencies, most of them have some sort of partnership with an agency or a supplier or a partner in India. Um, and to your point, Jeffrey, one of the reasons why they don't want to declare that is if you take, let me use the example of a large oil major, right, which has 25,000 people down in Bangalore doing their R&D. The agency in London doesn't want to declare the fact that they're using resources in India because they feel that it compromises their value proposition and they don't want to be compromised on the price. So they want to keep that margin for themselves. But they're all doing it. And I know that because lots of them are doing it with us. I think that's a great point. And a couple of things. First, I'd love to compliment the deal team, the API docs and your API. It's one of the best I've ever seen. Like. The amount of care that went into both structuring it and then communicating it 
that gives me a ton of confidence as a plot, a product and platform person that if I'm going to make an investment to integrate something into my ecosystem, first place I look is if the docs aren't well documented, what, what are all the things I can't see? So that was just fantastic. And your team should feel great. And I'm very excited to integrate open OA into that as an ecosystem partner on your slide that uh, on point five, one thing that I think is really important when you look at statistics, right? Averages are bad because if you have a ton of people that are very highly paid, you move the average. So a better way to measure the actual impact is you take the average of the median. And so you go, the median is a better indicator because it's the fat part of the bell curve. You don't have one person that makes $10 million and then a bunch of people that make 10,000, right? And so that's why average salary is a bad metric. The average median is the better because that really shows you what direction is the market going. In terms of the role types, when you talk about content, there are a couple of very specific business use cases for why. There's an explosion of influencer marketing. What does that mean? You need people that understand how to publish on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube Reels. And with all of that fragmentation of content production, a studio is now going to, here is the strategy for how we communicate, but the execution at the granular level of how do I put a logo, a headline into TikTok versus IG, that is so fragmented. And because of now the increased demand from brands to go, we have to have an influencer marketing strategy, they now have this reason to go directly to influencers who then have to create all of this high quality content that used to only come from WPP. Now, my buddy, Dan, he has a million and a half YouTube subscribers. When he works with a brand, he has to have polished production, content, all sorts of things. So like, I don't know for sure, but that's a pretty big macro reason for why you saw an uptick in content. Um, and then the, the final piece that I would say is because of things like the increasing focus on accessibility, there's a lot of platforms, streaming, content, that isn't compliant and they're gonna start getting fined like crazy. So they've got to figure out what is our content strategy to make content accessible. And so now you have these very large consultancies spinning up that are looking at all your landing pages, all your experiences, your in-app, anything. And if you're not compliant by you know, a few years from now, the fines are gonna be in millions of pounds a year. So you know, I, I would love to just continue talking through this stuff, but you know, I wanna make sure I leave air for others. That's great, Ben. Thanks. Hey, one of the questions that I've been struggling with, and I, I think it's super interesting, Ben, you kind of brought it to four for me is how does the, the the open talent market, you know, and the and the creator market like fit together? Right. Like I think that's that's a, a question that I've had. Whereas, you know, the way that I perceive it is open talent really is in service of you know organizations. I hire my services out to work for somebody else. Whereas a creator is actually a, a micro entrepreneur that is is a media company in and of themselves. I don't know if there's any any you know any. I, I don't know if they're the same thing or a little bit different or where they cross over, but it's something that I've been kind of interested in because if you add the creator numbers into the freelance market, it's a much much bigger market. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to John he or John Younger here because I'm sure you've you've thought about this a bit. And can, you know, I, can I ask a question on that, John, just before you respond, John Younger? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because most people in the passion economy, the creator economy, or maybe not most people, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably speaking um, uninformed here, but they probably have, they may well have jobs as well, right? So they're employees and then they're working on Etsy or they're, you know, they're, they're doing social media or whatever it is they're, they're doing the passion economy. So, you know, is there a crossover and I was interested in, in, from a deal perspective, whether employers are worried about that, you know, mm -hmm. whether an employee is a freelancer in the passion economy or otherwise side hustling, moonlighting and, and, and all of that. But John, why don't you go first and then maybe a Roland. I will, that. but big question, Barry, thanks. But honestly, the best person to answer this is Steve King. Oh, of course. Oh, and there's Steve, yeah, Steve's here. Steve, yeah. I know we're just moving it around. We're moving the ball around. I love it. Steve and I, I argue about Steve and I argue about our <laughs> estimates of full time versus side gig, at least within the U.S. Steve, take it away because you're authoritative in this area. In in terms of Steve, in terms of the U.S. In. Yeah, in terms of the U.S. creator economy. It is about two thirds of the people who earn money doing creator economy work um, have other sources of income, of which about half of those have 
traditional jobs. The others are doing other things as independent workers. We're actually coming out with a report on this topic next week. So um, <laughs> we're, uh, we, we have some data coming, but yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly a side gig effort, but in a lot of cases, those people um, are also independent workers doing other forms of creative work. They're designers, they're, they're and et cetera, writers. Um, but it is mostly a, a, a side thing. Um, employers uh, so far aren't really on top of, of side gigs of their employment base. And so that that's a to be decided issue. Some companies are pretty good about it, know it. We work a lot with Intuit Corporation and because they serve small businesses, they let their employees do all sorts of side gigs and the employees are not shy about sharing that information. Most companies, the side giggers keep it very quiet. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, John. So yeah, this is a great discussion. I feel like we could continue for hours. So I appreciate all the contributions and um, everyone joining the call. If we didn't get to you, um, feel free to submit your questions to me. Um, we'll get them answered. Um, but mark your calendars. The next community call is on Thursday, April 6th. Uh, Jeff Schwartz from GLOAT will be sharing the latest MIT and Deloitte research on how organizations are intentionally orchestrating workforce ecosystems. So thanks for all of you for being here. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to see you on the next one. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Ashley. You, Great John. job. And Jeff, good thanks. Luck England thanks on Saturday, much. Connor Heaney. What's that? <laughs> it's England, Ireland on Saturday. And uh, uh -oh. Ireland. this is rugby. <laughs> We look forward to the win. Wednesday right. tomorrow. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to talking to you on Monday. Love it. I can't, I can't wait to talk to you on Monday. Bye. Take care, everyone. Lovely to see you. See you in Copenhagen. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Guys.